thank you. Um, well, first of all, thanks the, to the users for the possibility of being here. It's good that I present these results. Um, the work that I will be talking about is work together with two of my masters, well, with my two master students uh, at home in Budapest, Borsi Márton and Priscsák Levente. And uh, I'm very happy that this uh, topic that I will be talking about it really fits into this conference. So the title of this workshop is Emergent Hydrodynamics in Low Dimensional Systems. And I am talking about something which is really central to this, namely expectation values of currents in beta ansatz. So le let me just give a very quick uh, introduction, but you all know this, so I will be really, really quick. So we are talking about one-dimensional integrable models. We have this theory of generalized hydrodynamics. It was started in these two papers, which was mentioned uh, many times in this conference. This theory can describe ballistic transport, which is uh, physics at the Euler scale, but we also heard in the last talk by Jacopo that it can also describe diffusive corrections. It was given, the theory was given uh, in these two papers. Now, uh, what are the foundations of this theory, foundations of general hydrodynamics? I will be, again, very, very quick because you heard about this, for example, in Benjamin's talk. So we have the assumption in hydrodynamics that there are fluid cells in our system, such that uh, there are some local, local equilibrium, equilibria, so that we have some kind of space and time dependent equilibrium states. In our models, we have, we have integrable models, so we have conserved charges, we have some con local conserved charges, and for example, in the x axis spin chain, we also have quasi-local conserved charges. I will not go into the story of how to obtain them and what are quasi-local charges. Uh, I think many of, you know already, many of you already know about this. Then, when we want to establish the theory, we necessarily need to deal with the continuity relations for the charges. And in practice, when we are dealing with these continuity relations, then we are talking about beta root densities. So this is a beta root density where n is some kind of particle index. It can correspond to strings in XXJ model, for example, or some other particle types. Then theta is the rapidity variable of the, of the beta ansatz particles, bare particles. And X and T just tells us that this is a particle distribution which depends on the space and time where we are looking at the local equilibrium. Now, when we want to do something with this continuity relation for the charges, then we need to have some kind of expression which tells us how to compute mean values of the charges and currents in ca some kind of equilibrium states. Uh, this, in other terms, we need to have some kind of uh, correspondence between the beta root densities and the mean values of these operators. Because how we derive the theory is just by taking as a first step mean value of this continuity relation. And then there are two formulas which are very often, I mean, which are cited in basically every talk which is talking about uh, generalized hydrodynamics, these two formulas for mean values of the charge and current operators. So the first formula here is for the mean value of the charge, and this basically follows from the additivity of the charge by definition, um, by definition of the charges. So mean value is given by as an integral where we integrate the one particle charge uh, eigenvalue uh, multiplied by the density of the beta roots, which are uh, there. And we also have a second formula which tells us what is the mean value for, for the currents. Cor this current is the current corresponding to this charge. And this formula takes the following form, very similar to the first one, but instead of just having the beta root density and the uh, charges corresponding to the one particle eigenvalues, we also need to multiply them with some kind of effective velocity, which describes us how how quickly these bare particles propagate in, in this equilibrium state uh, where the equilibrium state is, uh, serves as some kind of background where the other particles also play some effect. Now this was explained in earlier talks and it was also explained that as far as I know for this formula there has not been any general uh, quantum mechanical proof, at least certainly not for the XXZ spin chain. And this is what I will be talking about, establishing this formula using a rigorous quantum mechanical proof. So this will be the topic of my talk. But let me just uh, set the framework a little bit that I will be talking about. So I will consider some kind of generic quantum integrable model with non-nested beta ansatz. Extension to nested cases is a topic of further research. I mean, we can talk about this, but for the moment, let us assume that it's not, not nested, simple beta ansatz. But I will not, not really specify what quantum integrable model I am talking about. So the result I will be presenting fit is actually valid for many, many models. Uh, 
uh, I will specify in, in what sense uh, the in, I will specify later what is the validity. It's very important that I will be talking about a finite volume situation with finite particle number. So this, this is a different approach than what was used when people attempted a proof of the current mean value, because earlier proofs uh, were directly done in, in infinite volume. Instead, I say that we should really go back to finite volume and find some nice formula in finite volume, and let us take the thermodynamic limit afterward. First, we want to prove the finite volume formula. And I will be concentrating on lattice models, but this is not really a, not really a strong constraint. I mean, the results are valid, for example, in the lieb linear model. I will mention this. But uh, for the formulas, I will write lattice situations. So instead of integrals over space, I will write summation over uh, space, uh, well, summation over sides. The plan of my talk is the following. First, I will present you the new result for the finite volume situation. Then I will talk a little bit about its interpretation. How can we understand it and what are certain examples of this? And later, at the end, I will show you uh, how the proof goes. Because I think uh, that's a little bit technical. It's very important to get the interpretation of the result. OK, let us start. So we have, we have uh, lattice systems, and we assume that we have some local conserved charges. For the moment, I'm concentrating only of the, for the, no, I'm concentrating at the local charges. Quasi-local is a second step if you want to do them. These are local charges typically obtained from some kind of transfer matrix construction. We, they are given by uh, summation over some charge density. I use the same letter here. I hope it's not confusing. So QKX is a charge density, and it's an operator. If, if we index everything according to the conventions that I like, then this index K tells us that this QK spans K sides. So it's an integer index which runs from 1 to infinity. 1 corresponds to spin z, let's say, for example. And typically, H Hamiltonian can be un, uh, identified with the Q2, or proportional to Q2, depending on how we choose things. Because Hamiltonian is typically a two-site operator. Now, we have the overall conservation law for these charges, which means that each of these charges commute with the Hamiltonian. They also commute, commute with each other as a uh, consequence of Young-Baxter equation, etc. Um, OK, so we have this commutation relation that this is equal to 0. However, if we choose a different thing, if we want to look at the local continuity relation, then we can ask ourselves in the Heisenberg picture, what is the time derivative of a summed up charge density where we do the summation not over the full volume, but between two sides in an interval between A and B. Then the time derivative of this operator is, of course, given by this commutator. And as an effect of the global conservation law, um, you can argue that this has to be written as a difference of two operators where uh, these are the associated uh, current operators positioned at the two boundaries. So in some sense, this is the definition. This commutation relation serves as a definition for the current operators associated to these charges. Now, what do we want to do? We want to compute in this finite volume situation the mean value of the current operators, let's say positioned at zero, but it's not very important, in any kind of excited state of the model. This is what we want to do. Now, we are talking about beta and that solvable models. We have the beta states. Um, the beta states are parameterized by rapidities. They are given by this theta. And uh, we are looking at n particle states, so n is number of particles. We have the beta equations. In the simplest case, non-nested beta ansatz, they have this form. Well, p is uh, momentum parameterized by the rapidities. Then s is scattering phase. And it is given by well, scattering matrix, scattering amplitude, so to say. And this delta is the scattering phase. Now, for the charge mean values, when this Q alpha is the global charge, it's the integrated charge density, we know that the charge mean values are simply additive. So th we, s we need to sum up the one particle charge uh, eigenvalues. And this follows from extensivity, extensivity of the charges. Now, what happens with the current mean values? And here I sh present you our new result. So the statement is that if we want to compute the mean value of the current operator associated to this charge, here alpha is some index corresponding to the charge, in any excited state of the finite volume beta and that system. It is given by this formula where, um, let me explain, this G is a matrix. It is the Godin matrix I will specify later. So this is the inverse of the Godin matrix. And this is a sandwich between two vectors. So this is also a vector. This is also a vector. The length of the vector is equal to the number of particles. And let me specify. Uh, here. So 
this Q alpha is a vector such that the J elem jth element is e equal. You can see the one particle char uh, charge eigenvalue evaluated on the rapidity J or theta J. Then this E prime vector is similar, but instead of the charge eigenvalue, we have this E prime function. E prime is the derivative of the energy eigenvalue with respect to theta. And G is the Godin matrix, which in, the in, in this formulation, it is given by the, well, derivative Jacobian of the beta equations when we take the logarithm also here. So this P, P prime is derivative of this P function, and phi is the differential scattering kernel, so this phi function is derivative of this delta here. So we just need to take the logarithm of this, then take the Jacobian, and then we get this matrix. So this formula for the current mean values, I think it's new, but uh, if somebody knows that it was written down earlier, then please correct me, but I think it's new. Um, and let us investigate it a little bit. So it's, uh, the dependence on the charge comes through here because these are the charge eigenvalues. Now the dependence on the model, on the beta equations and everything comes through the Godin matrix. And the determinants uh, on the Hamiltonian comes through this vector, the energy derivative vector, so to say. It's important to know which operator generates the time evolution. So this is why it's important to see that the dependence on the Hamiltonian comes in through this factor. And I argue that uh, this formula should be quite general. I think it should be valid in many models. We have a proof uh, for this in models of the XXZ and XXX type uh, using algebraic beta ansatz and form factor expansion. I will talk about this. So for example, it should be, I mean, our proof I think already applies for higher spin integrable XXZ and these kind of models. But I think it is so simple and suggestive then it's very likely that this holds even in other models. Some kind of generalization of this should hold even in nested models or something. But we are not there yet. So it's a topic of uh, later research. Now I will be talking about non-nested uh, simple cases. So let us understand this formula a little bit better. In the one particle case, the Godin matrix is simply, it does not have any in interaction. So the Godin matrix is just one matrix element, volume times the P derivative function. So our formula in this case gives this is a formula. In this case, it's not a matrix sandwich, which is just a product of uh, a simple numbers, so to say. And we get this formula. So the current mean value is given by the charge mean value multiplied by 1 over L factor, which is, uh, just comes from the volume. And this quantity, where obviously this is the derivative of energy with respect to momentum. So this is the bare um, velocity of uh, group velocity of particle propagation. So this is what we would expect. Uh, for any kind of one particle uh, system. This is good. What do we get in a free system if we have a many particle state in a free system? In a free system, the Godin matrix is diagonal because there is no interaction. So if this matrix is diagonal, then you can think that in this sandwich, we would get a sum of these terms uh, corresponding to each of the individual particles. And indeed, so for example, for the charge, we get this sum as expected, but this also is an interacting case. But for the free case, the mean value of the charge, no, sorry, mean value of the current comes out as this formula where we sum over these velocities, which is computed from the one particle solution multiplied by the charge eigenvalue which the particles carry. And okay, in a free system, the states can be created by free uh, creation operators. And in a particular model, the XX model, which is equivalent to free fermions, my, my uh, ma um, master student who was actually a bachelor student at that time checked this formula very explicitly and it is, it is correct. I think in this model it was certainly written somewhere in the literature but anyway we did this calculation really just to get a first insight. But this is a free model with many particle cases but we can go on. So let me go on. And now I will be talking about the semi-classical picture which we can associate to this situation. And this is the interacting case. But it's important to keep in mind that we are in the finite volume situation. So we, we have a finite number of particles. A finite number of particles which are traveling around in this volume. We have periodic boundary conditions. And the only thing which happens is in the semi classical picture that we have two body scattering. So as long as the particles don't meet, they travel with their own group velocities. But when they meet, then there is a scattering phase. And we know very well that from this scattering phase, there comes a time delay in, in the semi-classical picture when we are talking about the wave fronts. And the time delay can always be computed by taking derivatives of the scattering phase with respect to the momenta. 
I mean, this goes back to early works of Wigner. And this picture was actually, of course, used also in other works in GHD. Let me just say what comes out in this uh, situation when we have a finite number of particles. It turns out that um, as the particles move along, um, they move with their own velocities, they scatter on the partic other particles many times, and they suffer these time delays. And as an effect of these time delays, their average velocity will be different. So what happens is, of course, that the order of the individual scattering, scatterings depends on where the particles are in this, on the this circle. But as we wait long enough, there will be a well-defined average velocity. So this is the idea. And this well-defined average velocity, it can be computed using sim simple self-consistent self computation. And what comes out already in this part, uh, simple semi-classical picture is that the average velocity in this situation has to be computed by taking the vector of the bare velocities and multiplying it with the inverse of the Gordon matrix. Now, this is a simple computation. And using this semi-classical picture, what we get for the current mean values is we simply multiply the charge, one particle charge eigenvalues with the average velocities, and the Gordon matrix inverse is symmetric, so when we switch this back, we get the sandwich what I had earlier. Um, one comment here that of course, this semi-classical picture of these time delays, etc. this was used in other works of the generalized hydrodynamics. So this, the basic idea here is not new. What is new here is that we just said that let us look at the finite volume situation with finite number of particles to get an insight what is happening here. In, early, in the other works where, where they did this, for example, with the free gas ideas, then the situation was that one particle was traveling and then it was meeting many other particles which, let's say, came from the other direction. And from these many, many scatterings came an average velocity. Now here, the difference is that one particle is meeting with the fixed other particles. I mean, it's not we have infinite particles in the system, but it, it is meeting the other ones many, many times. So this is just a difference. But otherwise, the argu argument is the same. And we get the same nice result. And in some sense, I can also give a comment that when, um, when we look up other, uh, other works on GHD and when they look at these uh, free guys ideas, then instead of the inverse of the Gordon matrix, they have some kind of integral equation, but this is the thermodynamic limit of this operation, basically. This we can show. So nice, we understand the semi-classical picture. Now let us move on. Um, we want to construct quantum mechanical exact proofs. Now there are certain special cases in which uh, proof is relatively easy. Um, one case it can rather serve as some kind of check of the formula is that in many models, for example, in these spin chains, the current associated to the energy, so the energy current, is actually proportional to the next conserved charge. This is a well-known property. So in, in many models with this property, it is true that the derivative of the momentum function is the energy function, and one more derivative with respect to rapidity is the Q3 eigenvalue, eigenvalue of the third charge. And then we can check what comes out from our formula. So this is the formula where we multiply these two vectors with the, in the middle with this Gordon matrix inverse. And like one or two lines of computation show very easily that in this case, indeed, we get the sum of the Q3 eigenvalues. I mean, we just need to use the definition of the Gordon matrix and uh, act with the Gordon matrix on a vector with constants one. And then we see immediately we can act with the inverse and then we get this identity. So it's a very simple identity. And I would say that this, is, this serves as some kind of, not a proof, but as a check of our formula. So there's no consistency problem here. Um, also, this case of checking the energy current, this was used in the early works, or, well, uh, maybe even both works. I'm, I'm not sure. But anyway, in the first two papers, th this was also used as a check. Now let us go on. This was maybe a too easy check, but anyway, it's a consistency check. Now, the other thing that we can look at is the spin current in XXZ model. So what we need to do is, as a, some kind of uh, auxiliary problem, we can take the globally twisted XXZ model. Or maybe we can also call this XXZ model with uh, magnetic flux. This is the same model that R. Wieser was also mentioning. So here we have these hopping, hopping amplitudes, which are different for the hopping to the left and for the hopping to the right. Now the nice thing is that when we take the derivative of this Hamiltonian with respect to the, this phi parameter, then indeed we get the current associated to the spin z conserve, uh, conserved, uh, well, uh, spin z operator, global spin z operator. Um, and from this, we can use the Hellman Feynman theorem to derive the mean value of this current. 
So it goes like this, that in order to compute the mean value of this current uh, from Heinemann Feynman, we need to, it is enough to compute the derivative of the energy eigenvalues. Now the energy eigenvalues, they can be computed for any phi using uh, beta ansatz. There is a it, this phi is a twist parameter. It enters into the beta ansatz equations. I did not write here the equations because this is, uh, I mean, three or four lines, but it's not so important, it's just some technical details. In any case, I just mentioned that these a n values are given through beta ansatz equations. Beta ansatz equations depend on phi. We can take the derivative with respect to phi. You can do this. It's a little exercise. We did this with Lorenzo Piroli. It's still unpublished. In any case, this gives us a direct proof of the mean value of the spin current. And it is e exactly equal to the general formula what I had some slides before. It does, actually. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, that, that's it, yes. Well, I, I said, well, I, I, I'm, saying, I'm not saying it's anything new, or not, uh, it's standard. So it's, uh, it's very standard. Um. No, 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 I mean, thi I mean thi this is the thing, the it's a trivial thing, but I think that it has not been used in this way to give the, the current mean values. So the, yeah, the beta ansatz part is very trivial. All right, um, so these are some simple examples. This was a, like a derivation of uh, in three lines, what we can do, and not very complicated. But we still are left with the problem of a generic proof for any kind of operator. And here I have, uh, have a comment that a simple proof is highly desirable. So what we can provide, we can provide a proof using form factor methods, form factor expansion, uh, and it's a little bit complicated proof. It has some ingredients, and we can fill in these ingredients, but um, it's not very intuitive. And I will explain a little bit later about the essence of this proof. But perhaps there is some kind of simple proof which would work for other operators too. So we have one proof, but it's not perhaps not the nicest one. But it's not clear whether or not a nice proof can be found, so I encourage everyone to think about it. So it's a, it's a nice problem, because it's a very simple result. It's a very simple result where the semi-classical result should be, it seems to be exact, well not, I, it is exact in these cases, even in the quantum theory, but the proof is a little bit complicated. I, I will return with some comments to this question. But at, at this point I also mentioned that directly in the thermodynamic limit, there have been some proofs using leclerc musardo series, and these, this is, these are valid for uh, quantum field theories. Um, for example, already in, in the, fir opa, already in the first, uh, paper that this was, uh, of course, uh, included. And there is also this new paper by Dean Longhu and Takato Yoshimura, where it was also worked out for mo uh, more cases and with uh, more detail. And I think Takato will talk about this. So this is uh, in the thermodynamic limit directly for quantum field theories. What we are doing is very similar to this, but we are doing it in finite volume. So in finite volume, we don't have the leclerc musardo series. But what we are doing is very similar to this, a form factor expansion, some kind of finite volume leclerc musardo if you wish. but I mean, I don't like to call it that. It's just uh, so that you have some kind of picture in mind what we are doing. I will talk about this. So we will, we will be using, okay, we can also call it a finite volume expansion theorem. Finite volume version of the Leclerc Musardo, if you want. We will go there. The main idea of the proof is basically the same what was, I, I don't know, mentioned many times again in this conference. So it's not. this is also not very new. The idea is that we should look at the definition of the charges, which are from the continuity relation, and take some kind of matrix elements of this uh, operator relation. Now, we want to have the mean values of the currents. Obviously, when we take the mean values of the two sides in a beta ansatz states, we get zero. So we get zero here because beta ansatz states are eigenvectors of H, and then commutator gives zero mean value, and here, we get zero mean value because we are talking about homogeneous situation in finite volume. So the trick is we should do something else. And um, I was thinking a little bit how to modify this 
equation such that uh, we would get some factor here such that the difference doesn't drop out, but it's not, it's not leading anywhere, or I didn't find any good way. Instead, what we do is the same thing what was done in other papers also. So we take off diagonal matrix elements. When we take off diagonal matrix element, then uh, this will connect us the off diagonal matrix elements of the charge and current operators. And here, as an effect of the commutator, we get the differences of the two energy eigenvalues. And here, as an effect of this shift, we get the difference of the momentum eigenvalues. And now we have a connection between the off-diagonal matrix elements. And now we have to find a good method such that we could use this information about all the off-diagonal matrix elements to find a relation between the diagonal matrix elements in finite volume. So this is the, this is the uh, thing that we need to do. And basically, in the thermodynamic limit, the leclerc musardo series was what achieves this. But now we will do it in a finite volume situation. Uh, and it's important, maybe I should mention here, that the leclerc musardo series operates on the level of uh, physical, well, bare, but still physical particles. Whereas in our case, we don't care about strings. So we have finite beta roots, and I don't care about string hypothesis. So our formula should be valid for any kind of exact solutions of the beta, beta equations. So no need to talk about uh, physical, part uh, physical um, particles, propagating particles at this point. Maybe for the semi-classical picture, but for the quantum proof, it's completely arbitrary beta roots. So what are the form factors? And what, how do the off-diagonal matrix elements look like? So the statement that I will tell now is, again, very general. The statement is that if we have a matrix element in finite volume between two normalized states, so these states are normalized to unity, then typically it has the form which is here on the right-hand side, that we have a function here which is called the form factor of this operator on these uh, sets of properties, divided by the square root of two Godin determinants. So these, these are Godin matrices defined in the earlier slides, and the determinants and the, the uh, square root. So they correspond, so to say, to the norms of these beta states, which we divided by. So, and this form factor function is a metamorphic function, which does not depend on the volume. So this is important. So when you think about the finite volume beta and that situation, then you have the beta equations, and you have solutions to the beta equations, and you have a discrete set of beta states. Perhaps finite, perhaps infinite number, but discrete. And the volume is very important because the volume tells you what are these beta roots. Nevertheless, here the statement is that uh, here this function is a form factor function which can be computed, for example, from an infinite volume situation. This form factor function does not depend on the volume explicitly anymore. So what we do is we take the form factor function, which is the infinite volume form factor function, and we substitute the rapidities, which are solutions from finite volume beta equations. This is what we need to do. We can also say that if we get rid of these factors, so we take unnormalized beta and that states, unnormalized means that these should be really the standard expression, sum over permutations without any kind of normalization, then this formula tells us that the matrix elements in finite volume and infinite volume are the same. So it's a physical amplitude, it's a physical transition amplitude, it does not depend on the volume. This is a very essential thing, and uh, this can be proven using algebraic beta and that. So Physically, this is a little bit uh, intuitively understandable, but I, I'm saying that in, in the standard beta ansatz, algebraic beta ansatz methods, this is very easy to prove using commutation relations, etc., etc. And you can argue that for on shell beta states, all the dependence on the volume drops out, and we get a very defined function. Um, okay. Now, what, the, what do we want? We want to have the diagonal matrix elements. So we want to have the case where these rapidities go to these rapidities. However, this is very problematic, and this is an old, old problem uh, which is very well known. So the statement is that in the finite volume case, when we go to the diagonal limit, it is not really a limit. There we have a discrete set of states, and we are jumping from one state to the other state. Uh, and we should do a jump from a neighboring state to the same state to get the mean value. However, on the right-hand side, we cannot do this jump, because this is a meromorphic function which has a really bad singularity when this set of rapidities approaches this set of rapidities. This is known. It has uh, n number of kinematic poles, and this diagonal limit is very problematic. And it is simply not true that any kind of diagonal limit here would, would reproduce the diagonal finite volume matrix element. This is known. What we can do is uh, we can de define the so-called symmetric diagonal form factors. This is one possible uh, 
how to say, prescription to deal with this diagonal limit. The other one is the connected one. I, I will not use it now. The symmetric diagonal form factor is defined as follows, that we shift all the rapidities on one side with a given epsilon, and we take the epsilon to zero limit. So we use the same shift. And this is a well-defined limit, and it will be a finite object. And now we have also, what I will use later, an expansion theorem for mean values. And this is very important. So it tells us that in a finite volume, the exact mean value of a local operator should be computed as it follows, what is given here. We have to have a summation over uh, bipartitionings of the set of rapidities into theta plus and theta minus. For each bipartitioning, we have to substitute one, one set of the rapidities into the symmetric form factor and the other set of the rapidities into some kind of smaller Godin determinant and take a smell, smaller Godin matrix and take a determinant. We have to sum over all partitionings and in the end divide by a Godin determinant which corresponds to well, the norm from coming from the two sides. Um, physically, what this describes is that here are some kind of physical processes where the theta plus rapidities, they interact with the operator, and the other theta minus rapidities, they contribute with some kind of partial norm. But this is just an intuitive picture. Uh, I mean, how it goes really, this is a matter of quantum mechanical proof, I mean, rigorous proof. It's, it's not something that you can guess. I mean, for example, when you would use here the so-called connected form factors, which is a little bit different, then you would get a different determinants here. So it's not, it's not evident. I mean, this has to be proven. Yeah? Um, in, 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 uh, in spin chains, beta and that's it is exact, and in field theory is exponential correction. Yeah. And okay, I, I can put forward, so this is why our, our formula for the current mean values, it should be valid up to exponential corrections in quantum field theory, and in spin chains it should be exact. Okay, and this formula was, I think, it's a, uh, well, perhaps in this form it was published in, uh, in our paper with Gabor Takac uh, in 2008, and this was during my time of the PhD, so I can tell you that uh, for me it's a pleasure to go back to this because it's uh, from my PhD work and now it's uh, proving useful again. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, about this. Uh, but I can also tell you that, I mean, the essence of this formula can be found in Koryapin's early works. So I don't know how many of people actually looked up technical details uh, of these early works, but it's useful. So you can go to the book of Koryapin, uh, Izergin Bogolyubov, and look what kind of formulas they have. For a generic operator, they did not state this formula. But for some specific operators, they have essentially uh, th this structure there. Um, so what we then need to do, we need to prove it in x, x, z. Because we wrote this down for quantum field theory in this paper. We had some arguments why it should work, and we had some non-trivial tests. Um, but for the x, x, z model, the in this form, for any kind of operator, it, it was never written down or never proven. So this is what we are doing now because we will be using this formula to get the current mean value. So we need to prove it. And I will talk about this proof, proof at the end of the, uh, this talk. Now, first, I want to talk, you, tell you about how we can use it. So we want to use it somehow. Um, we have this formula from the continuity equation which connects the off-diagonal matrix elements of the charge and current operators. Now we can take the symmetric limit and this is also, I mean, it has been done earlier. As a symmetric limit, we get these sums of energy derivative and momentum derivative. And then we have a connection between the symmetric form factors of the charge and current operators. And this formula was also in Benjamin papers, etc. So it's not new. Um, the new thing is that we can do with this in finite volume. So the plan is that we take the mean value of the charges. This is known. From the mean value of the charges, we extract what are the symmetric form factors of the charges. Then we use this relation to get the symmetric form factors of the currents. Then we have this expansion theorem. And then we need to sum this up, whatever comes out. And then we get a fa uh, our formula. Let's see how this goes. So for the symmetric form factors of the charges, we get this formula. And this is also present. I'm sure it's present in Takato's work, but maybe even Benjamin, I don't know. Um, but I checked that in Takato's paper it is there. Um, the statement is we can compute it in the following way. Here are three factors. One factor is sum over the one particle charge eigenvalues. Other factor is sum over this P derivative uh, eigenvalues. Um, and here we have a summation over spanning trees. So we have to draw a graph of n uh, vertices. 
and we have to construct all of the spanning trees of this graph. And for each of the spanning trees, we have to collect the um, phi, the differential scattering kernels corresponding to each of the links, where each of the, each of the vertices corresponds to one of the rapidities. So this follows, actually, I mean, there are different ways of how we can derive it, and it has been there in the literature, but I'm just saying that it can be extracted directly from this expansion theorem, so I if we want. Now, using this, we can use the con what comes out from the continuity relation, and then basically we replace this P prime with the E prime. So it's very similar, but many things have changed. I mean, for the charges, this P prime is the same thing which is in the Godin determinant, and that's why when we sum everything up, uh, it will be a sum over this, these eigenvalues. However, when we change this P prime to E prime, then the summation changes a lot, because this E prime is not inside the Godin matrix, so something else will come out. And now this is our statement that when we take these symmetric form factors of the currents, we sum up this uh, sum over B partitions, then we get this formula. Uh, and it's a, it's a technical computation, so I will, I will not explain to you how it goes. I will just say, uh, well, roughly. I, I want to spare you the technical details. So what we did is a graph theoretical, graph theoretical proof, very similar to what Takato are doing. Um, when we want to do this summation, one particle is trivial, two particle is relatively easy, three particle you do it in uh, two or three pages, but then it gets really messy. So imagine that you want to prove this formula where you have the inverse of the Godin matrix, so you need to somehow compute it, but this is not completely trivial. And for the Godin matrix and determinant of the Godin matrix, there are some expressions using graph theoretical arguments, some over spanning trees, forests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and we have one proof. I mean, this is a rigorous proof. It's written down, but it will only go to the appendix. I'm not, I don't know how many people will actually check the proof. But we have a rigorous proof that when we sum this up, then this is reproduced. So I will just give one more comment that when you know that when you take the inverse of a matrix, then it is can be given by the, I don't know, adjunct or I don't know, a classical adjunct matrix divided by the determinant. There is this formula. And the, the divi division by the determinant is also here. So you can imagine that here what is in the numerator will correspond to all of the numerator things which come from this inverse and somehow multiplied by these uh, two legs and the legs are also here. But how it gets organized, this is very non-trivial. So we really need some kind of graph, theoreti graph theoretical arguments. We, we have this bipartitioning here and we have some spanning trees here, some spanning trees here and some links which connect them and it's a spanning tree of the whole graph and things like that. And you need to go to into the detail and then you convince yourself that okay it is really this um, so I, I, I didn't want to show more details about this actually my my master student Levent uh, did all the details and then and then we discussed but it's uh, it, it even for him I mean it took uh, one month or something like this to figure everything out it's not it's not completely trivial but it can be done so that's fine so from this we see that this formula should be valid in all models in which we have this expansion theorem where was it in, in which we have this ex expansion theorem established. We need to establish it also in, in the models that we want, for example, uh, models of XXZ and XXX type. Um, what about the proofs now? First, uh, again, a quick comment. So in quantum field theory, we know by today that this finite volume expansion theorem is completely equivalent with the leclerc musado series. I don't know how much this is well known, so let me give a few comments about this. So in this paper, in uh, 2010, I showed that the leclerc musardo series can be derived as a thermodynamic limit of the expansion theorem. But also there was this other paper four years later where uh, in this excited state TBA framework, I showed that when we assume that the leclerc musardo series is valid, then we can go also backwards. And using analytic continuation, we can show that the finite volume expansion theorem is correct. So this is th these are completely equivalent to each other. Uh, this is just a comment, but, but this is only in quantum field theory. So we need to do it in algebraic beta ansatz. I will talk about this. So in algebraic beta ansatz, we have a monodromy matrix. OK, it should be M here, but I wrote T. OK, I'm anyway. So monodromy matrix is product of some lux operators. In the simplest case, they are the same as uh, R matrices. And you know very well that they, uh, we like to write them as A, B, C, D with uh, spectra parameter dependence. And my statement is, which was not yet proven, or uh, anyway, written down is that our expansion theorem holds for any product of these ABCD monodromy matrix elements for any 
rapidities. This might be a little bit surprising, and let me explain to you why it might be surprising. When we look at any of these uh, possibilities, then they will be not local operators. So how, how, can you ask, how is it possible? I was talking about local operators all the time. The solution is that in a finite chain, there is no distinction between local and no, non-local operators. So think about this, that when we have a finite chain of 10 sites, then we can construct any kind of operator which spans the whole system. It, ha it spans 10 sites. But when I look at the same operator in uh, an infinite volume system, well, 10 sites, it's a local operator. It's localized somehow in a, some kind of small neighborhood. So this is the idea. The proof that we are constructing is a recursion relation in the number of particles. And it does not care about the volume, so to say. And this recursion uses some arguments what we also have in the infinite volume system, but it does not matter really. It is about singularity properties of certain overlaps. And the volume and this locality is not important at all, but we have in the mind that as soon, as soon as we pick one particular monodromy matrix, then we are in a finite volume system. And just remember that in finite volume, it does not make any sense to make a distinction between local or non-local operators. There, there can be short operators or longer operators, whatever, but there is no clear distinction there. And this is important. So, now this is my statement. And how do we prove then the expansion theorem? Again, the proof goes back to the very old, uh, but still very fruitful ideas of Koryapin and, and the pioneers of this integrability business. So what we need to do is we take uh, this scalar product between two arbitrary beta states. Here, the Bs are with these theta primes, and the Cs are with the original thetas. And in the middle, we have this local operator O, which is, well, I'm saying local, but anyway, thi this kind of operator. And we want to look at the singularities of this object when these rapidities approach these rapidities here and to get to the mean values. And this is essentially the same proof what Koryapin did for the Godin uh, matrix, Godin determinant, for the norm of the beta ansatz wave function. So when, when this O operator is just the identity, then we have the scalar product of two on-shell beta states. And investigating the singularities, kinematical poles, we can prove that the norm of a beta state is really the Godin determinant. What we are doing is basically a little bit extension of this method when we, we have an insertion. But you can imagine that when we insert these operators, then we can use some kind of commutation relations, and we can play the same game with a little bit of modifications. So again, some combinatory uh, uh, argument needs to be done here, and I'm not saying that we have the nicest argument. We have some kind of uh, cases. Uh, we will work a little bit to have the simplest argument possible. But we have one argument. Um, which is about certain ordering of these X operators. And then, I mean, I in the papers of the Leon group, a lot of uh, statements are written what happens when these operators act on a beta state. So this is very standard. We can use it. As soon as we have the singularities, we can investigate the kinematical poles and look what happens with these apparent kinematical poles. If you know how the correcting proof goes, then I can just tell you that it's the same. If you don't know, then sorry, I don't I go want to go into these technical details. Along this line, you can prove the expansion theorem in XZ. And what is very important that this uh, theorem then uh, holds for any kind of beta roots. I already said it earlier, but now I'm repeating it. It does not care about string hypothesis. So exact solutions of the beta equations. This is important. And one more thing what I already said, but it's good to repeat that this expansion theorem will then hold for any operator of the finite chain. Now. This also needs a little bit of elaboration because here I said that any kind of this product of A, B, C, opa, of A, where am I? A, B, C, and D, but using the so-called solution of the inverse problem, uh, you know that any kind of local or no, well, any kind of operator of the finite chain can be expressed as combination of these. Uh, again, I will not go into this, but using an inhomogeneous chain, you can do this. Uh, this also goes back to work of the Leon group and also Gehman and Korepin. Nice. So with this, we have proven the expansion theorem for XXZ type models, or XXZ, XXX type models. And with this, we have also proven our, our uh, formula, main formula, because I already talked about the summation in the earlier slides. So this is very nice. What else can we see or uh, say? Because there are some interesting things still, uh, even though I have already told you the proof. Let us consider the more general problem of time evolution generated by some other charge. 
So remember that the charges all commute with each other. Um, and in physical situations, the time evolution is generated by Hamiltonian, right? Because this is our physical model. But why not consider time evolution under some other charge? And then we can also set up a continuity relation for, let's say, the Q alpha under the time evolution of Q beta. Why not? Then we get a continuity relation where we have some kind of current operators which have two indices. One index tells us that this is the current of the charge alpha with index alpha under time evolution generated by the charge beta, so to say. And then we can also ask ourselves what are the mean values of these generated current operators in any kind of beta state. And using simple repetition of what we did earlier, we get this formula. So here it's almost the same as before. Here is, this is the inverse of the Godin matrix. This is the charge of alpha, vector of made of the charge eigenvalues of uh, the charge alpha. And here we have this Q beta plus one. I mean, I could have written Q beta derivative, but in these models, when I add one to the index, it's usually derivative. Um, so this is a very general statement now, and our proof, what I said earlier, applies also to this case. So this can be considered proven. Now, why is this interesting? I, I'm telling you this is interesting. When we look at, in the X and XXZ models, when we look at quantities defined in this form, what I had earlier, inverse of the Godin matrix sandwiched between two vectors with this index n and m, which are indices of how many times we take derivatives of some func functions. And these are vectors such that, the, that such that the elements of these vectors are these specific functions evaluated at the specific rapidity. Now, these quantities, which are defined in this form, are known to be the building flocks for the so-called factorized correlation functions. So I don't know how, many, how much the audience is familiar with this theory of factorization of correlation functions. It's uh, quite established and uh, perhaps difficult, but uh, very well understood uh, theory. And I can say that the biggest names of uh, this business contributed to this theory. I do, I do not say, I did not write the references, but it's a series of papers. Hidden Grassmannian structure in XXZ model and things like that. You can look up. And the statement is that in the XXX model, there is one basic function of two variables, such that these are the derivatives, partial derivatives. In the XXZ model, there, is, there are two functions, something like this psi and the psi prime function, a different function, such that any kind of local observable, mean value of any kind of local observable, can be expressed as sums of products of these basic building blocks. So this is what we understand as under factorization. It is called factorization because usually for the mean value of some kind of local observable in any kind of state, it can be excited state, thermal state, ground state, anything, usually we would get multiple integral formulas, which are difficult to evaluate. But what these people have shown, actually I, have, I should have put here Korepin because he was one of the starting uh, points. I, I forgot, but it, it was Korepin, Bos, and maybe someone else who started the business. It was observed that these multiple integral formulas can be factorized. And it can, in the end, they can be described by combinations of simple integrals. And these simple integrals are these objects. In finite volume, it is just a sum, basically, or, or this sandwich. But in infinite volume, these will be simple integrals of some auxiliary functions multiplied by some of these charge eigenvalues or something like this. So the statement is that any observable can be expressed as some kind of this combination of these simple, simple building blocks. And this theory is also, I mean, they also say that this consists of two parts, the so-called algebraic part and the physical part. The algebraic part tells us that if we pick one operator, then what is the series what we get here? Uh, what is uh, the factorization, algebraic factorization procedure? The physical part is that we should give values to these building blocks. I mean, what I say, see here, for example, this definition is uh, providing the physical part for excited states in XXZ model, in finite term XXZ model. The statement is that the factorization, so the algebraic part, is the same for all excited states. So it does not depend on, uh, on the, how to say, ensemble in which we are evaluating this. The algebraic part, so this part of the formula, only depends on the operator. This is the statement. Okay, so. However, the physical part depends on the ensemble in which we are taking our mean value. Um, and I can say that here, with our statement of the current mean values, we, we can say that we have solved the inverse problem in this respect. Here the inverse problem is what operator corresponds to a single of these building blocks. Because what we have seen here 
that for these generalized currents, we get exactly these building blocks with one index shifted. Uh, these are the building blocks. And now we have solved this inverse problem. So usually in this theory, what people understand is they take one operator like this and they expand it into some kind of series here. But the inverse problem was not yet treated. If I ask what is the operator such that the mean value of the operator should be given by a single piece of single building block, then now we know that these are these general currents. And I was talking to uh, Frank Goeman and I asked him if this is known or not known and he told me, well, his first answer was that this is not known. So perhaps it is easy to compute, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's uh, perhaps in this case, I mean, for someone who knows the whole, whole theory of this factorization business, perhaps it would be easy to derive. I don't know, but this is not, I mean, uh, for the first reply of Frank was that uh, this is not known, so he doesn't know about these currents. Yeah? In some sense, in some sense. Yeah. But, uh, but I don't know in what sense it is a basis for this algebraic construction, because I don't know this theory. I know the main statement, so. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, but, uh, but not, not as a sum. So you see it's a sums of products. It's, a mo it's more complicated than simply a linear basis or something. Okay, so we have found something. And perhaps, perhaps these experts will give, like, I don't know, three lines of proof for this or perhaps not. I, I don't know yet. But in any case, um, what I wanted to point out that our formula for these mean values should be more, more general than this factorization business because this is very specific to XXZ and in some sense weak 6, six in, in for one part. But my argument with the form factor expansion and also how, how the end result is nice and can be, uh, can be understood, understood semi-classically shows that per very probably this is more general. And in some sense, this is also gives us some interesting research direction because we can look at nested beta ansatz or perhaps other models and then see if the mean value is really can be generalized and we can have some exact formula there because it is known that in nested beta ansatz, this factorization cannot work. I mean, Smirnov and others already know this, but perhaps there will be some remnants of this. And then if it is true, then we have found that these generalized currents are the remnants of this very efficient factorization, which would hold in other models too. So this is a, an interesting direction. This is interesting for the general theory of correlation functions in integrable models. Okay, so to summary, sum up what we have, we have an exact finite volume formula for current mean values. Um, we have, uh, I don't know how su had suggestive, I don't know why I actually wrote it. So <laughs> we have, we have, oh no, it's uh, not a proof. Okay, it's a suggestive simple form. So, okay, so the proof is not, not suggestive and not simple, but anyway, the final form is simple. So this tells us that probably this is valid in other models too. And that's why I'm saying that more simple proofs are needed. But here I actually have one more comment now that you have seen everything. Um, we have the statement that the norm of the beta state is the Godin determinant. Now, I don't know if anybody or how many of you have actually tried to prove this, but uh, to prove this, you have really, I mean, the only thing I know is to go back to the method of Korea pin, and this is not a nice proof. So the end formula is very suggestive, very nice, but the, the standard proof towards it is not nice. And uh, there is one proof, in, I, don't, I forgot the authors, but another proof which is not, not a constructive proof, but some kind of argument of, Hellman Feynman type, something like this, uh, where they have an argument, but that's not a proof. So the real constructive proof is only through Korepin. And our, our proof is really in the spirit of Korepin. So it might be possible that we have another example where the end result is very simple, but the road towards is it not simple. Or put it other ways, uh, if you want to find a really simple proof for our result, then you should be able to find a more simple proof for the Godin determinant. Because we are doing basically the same thing, a little bit more complicated. So that's it, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Balazs, for the nice talk. It's time for questions.